a very warm welcome to Professor Dinesh Singh, our Vice Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellor, many other teachers, and of course, the wonderful group of students who have come on this very special day. We begin today with the first lecture in the series, India in the 21st Century. This lecture will be delivered by Vice Chancellor Professor Dinesh Singh, and this is an overview of the subject which will introduce all of us to the significant contemporary developments, changes, and possibilities in India. And we are indeed very grateful to the Vice Chancellor for agreeing to do this overview lecture. And we are also very grateful to the four colleges that are partnering this first phase and this experimental beginning that we are uh, conducting today of this massive online lectures. These will be available at the colleges on locational sites which are visible to the speaker. And following the lecture, there will be an interactive session with these four colleges. There will also be room for a few questions from the students who are present today. But the time being limited, we will have to be very, very careful to keep the questions brief and pointed. So may I now request Vice Chancellor Professor Dinesh Singh a great scholar, mathematician, and a person with a great vision of higher education in India to please come to the podium and give his lecture. Good afternoon, everybody. I welcome you to this experiment where we will try and see how well technology allows us to connect for purposes of education to enable young minds to take leaps of imagination and power for their own betterment and consequently for the betterment of the country and of society. You may be aware that the title of my lecture is India in the 21st century. Let me at the outset make it very clear that by no stretch of imagination am I a historian or a political scientist and I'm not trying to dabble in these realms of study. This is a very personal viewpoint and I hope that through this we may be able to gain things and we may be able to understand India a little better. I would like to primarily address students, young minds, even though there are faculty present who are witnessing this lecture. And so, there will be things I will refer to that those who are here as students will not have witnessed firsthand. To talk of India in the 21st century, it is important to try and understand how we were just around and after the time of independence. I was born in the decade after independence, in the 50s. And I remember many things as a child. There are several things. You may or may not have read about them. You may or may not have heard your parents speak about them. But in the decade of the 60s, in the early 60s, there was an air of enthusiasm and optimism 
we were in many ways a young country. Of course, India is a land that has been around with great glory since time immemorial. But the full strength and power of India under foreign rule had been somehow subdued. And that power had begun to unleash itself just after independence, when we had our own destiny under our own control. And I remember as a child, listening to my parents and their friends talking to each other, conversations, discussions, about how they felt the country would do, that they were optimistic. And then I remember so well, even though I was just beginning my kindergarten, when a debacle happened. It shook India to its very core. And I talk of the Chinese invasion in 62. India was shaken. Suddenly our prestige seemed to have diminished on the international scale. The Chinese army began to overrun Indian territory at will. The Indian soldier fought bravely in courage. Our soldier is second to none. But they were not well equipped. There were no proper supply chains, no proper means of communication. In fact, they did not even have proper clothing. They had limited ammunition and out-of-date weaponry. And we could not withstand the Chinese assault. You can imagine how demoralizing it is. I remember distinctly a radio address by our then Prime Minister, the late Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru. His voice, even as a child I could perceive, was broken. A voice that was sad, burdened. And what was he talking about? He was talking about having been betrayed by the land across the Himalayas whom he and India had treated as a friend. The thing that struck me as a child was, why is India so powerless? Why have we allowed this to happen? Why can we not take on the Chinese? Where are we lacking? Why don't we have weapons? There is a letter Prime Minister Nehru wrote to the then U.S. President John F. Kennedy. Nehru was regarded as the apostle of non-alignment, that India would not align with the two major superpowers, the Soviet Union and the United States. We had been treading an independent path. And just a little before the Chinese debacle, Prime Minister Nehru had lectured to President Kennedy on their policy vis-a-vis -vis Vietnam. But when the Chinese debacle happened and India was powerless, what could we do? Prime Minister Nehru wrote a, wrote a letter to President Kennedy literally seeking their support unconditionally, asking for weapons, even bullets, ammunition, Clothing, that is how badly off we were. And you can see then, India's prestige on the international level was severely dented. A nation demoralized just a few years after independence. Just a few years. The 
There were other things I remember from my childhood. I remember I grew up in the city of Baroda in Gujarat. And I do not know if children and students who live in Delhi today can even believe this. But in those days, the sky used to be absolutely blue in the daytime and crystal clear with stars and planets at night. You could see the Milky Way clearly across the sky. And as children, obviously, you become curious about things. And I remember in the 60s, Watching satellites go across, traversing the sky at night. The first satellite to be launched was the Sputnik by the Soviet Union. We always referred to them in those days as Russia. But it was the Soviet Union. And consequently, they launched two more Sputniks. And the United States had also joined the so-called space race. And for us, every satellite was a Sputnik. It became a... And we watched with excitement, but also tinged with a certain degree of hope and disappointment that India was nowhere on the scene. Why could our country not do something like that? The Soviets and the United States got into this race. And then the U.S., because it had been outmatched by the Soviets in terms of launching first a satellite and then a human into space, announced that they will send a man to the moon. And there was excitement. But again, India was nowhere on the scene. This great land with such an ancient and glorious past in the realm of science and technology and knowledge was nowhere. And you can imagine as a child, it affects you a little bit. I remember writing essay after essay as a schoolboy, and I was not the only one. There were so many amongst my friends, classmates who did the same. We always wrote when asked what would be like to be when we grew up, that we would like to be scientists. We would like to use science and knowledge to help the country, to make it strong, to make it powerful, to allow the country to reclaim its glory. There are other memories I have. I remember as a child, each year on different days, different times of the year, we got inoculated. We got inoculated against smallpox, which was a bit of a scourge. We got inoculated against typhoid, against cholera. And these were painful things, but you had to go through that. There used to be so many deaths each year due to cholera. There used to be so many deaths each year due to smallpox. And we seemed helpless. The only thing that we could take recourse to was inoculation. And God forbid if anyone came down with any of these diseases. Polio was also ha causing havoc in many parts of India. I had an older sibling whom we lost to polio. It affected people. There were other things happening. In the 60s, India faltered in the realm of agriculture. We just weren't producing enough food. There were famines, there were deaths due to starvation. There were droughts. And India was unable to match the needs of the hungry millions, the starving millions. And two things stick in my mind from that time. One, that we were constantly dependent on American food aid under the so-called PL480 program. We imported largely as a sort of gift huge amounts of wheat. The quality of the wheat wasn't very good. 
But you know, we could not choose the quality. We were dependent. We needed it so badly. We were paying for it, but we could not pay with foreign exchange. So we had to pay them with Indian rupees, which they would then use for their purposes in India at their will. You can imagine it's humiliating for a nation to be like that. I also remember food rationing. I remember it so well. Sugar was rationed. Other cereals were rationed. And you could only get that much which was allocated to you as a family. You had to stand in long queues to get your monthly rations. There were constant food shortages. I remember so well. Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri, this is the Indian Prime Minister, requesting citizens of India not to have dinner once a week, Monday, so that we could save some food. Imagine a Prime Minister had to take this recourse so that India could have reasonable food for all. It's demoralizing. It affects you. This is affecting people who are young, just growing up, and they know and read about other powerful nations. We were so dependent that when we were importing wheat from the United States under the PL480 program, it used to come in huge container ships and large quantities which we had no means of weighing. We had to pay for it, remember. But we had no means of weighing whether the amount, the weight, was what had been prescribed and sought. And as it turned out much, much later, we got shortchanged by the contractors who supplied the wheat to us from that nation. They knew we have no machines to weigh such large quantities. I'm not trying to demoralize you into thinking that India was not doing anything. Do not ever get that impression. There were many good things also happening and no one can keep India down. Remember that also. But I'm trying to give you some of these markers that seem to scar the psyche of a nation. I also remember other things. I remember infant mortality was high. I just told you, lost a sibling older than me to polio. I also remember this. In the 60s, if you had to make a phone call, you had to first find someone who had a telephone. And then to talk to the person you wished to talk was another ordeal if it was not a person in the city that you resided. You had to book a trunk call. It wasn't easy to get a phone connection. They were rare, few and far between. You had to be very rich, very powerful, very well connected to get a phone connection. And if you did manage to connect to a person outside your city through what was then called a trunk call, a national trunk call or an international trunk call, the sound, voice quality would be so poor you couldn't fully make out what was happening. And they were not always reliable. They would come after many hours, sometimes even a day or two after making a request. There were other problems with communication. If you look at roads, those days I remember, we used to travel often from Baroda to Ahmedabad by road. And I, if I remember correctly, it took us more than two hours, probably three hours each way. And it wasn't a very wide road. And it wasn't the best quality. It was okay, but there would be bumps and potholes which would appear suddenly without notice quite often. And there would be many accidents that would happen on the way. But that wasn't just peculiar to Delhi, Baroda and Ahmedabad. That was the state of even our, this was a state highway, but that was the situation with our national highways. There were highways. There was the so-called Indian modern Grand Trunk Road that went through Delhi all the way to Calcutta. 
but it was a road which was littered with accident sites and not in the best of quality, best of condition. I also remember something else. If you had to undertake a rail journey, and that was one of the most important means of communication, traveling in India in those days. If you wanted a rail reservation, suppose you wanted to travel from Delhi to Bombay, Mumbai, then you had to figure out what was your train of choice and go to the railway station, stand in a long queue for that train at a window where a reservation clerk would deal with each such person in a long queue, turn by turn, through a handheld pen and a register at his or her disposal. By the time your turn came, you would often be told, sorry, there are no seats available. And then, if you wanted to travel certainly and that train was not available, you had to get into another queue at another window for another train. And you still wouldn't know when your turn came, would there be a seat available or not. And God forbid, if you also wanted to book a return journey, then they would take a form, ask you to fill it up and send a telegram to the station from where you wanted to return. So if you were in Delhi and wanted to have a return journey from Mumbai to Delhi, a telegram would be sent to Mumbai and the response would come much later, many days later, and you wouldn't know. It was an ordeal. Of course, India was still functioning. We were still making progress. Lest you get that we were completely doomed. I'm not trying to give you that picture, but I'm trying to tell you the hurdles we were facing. There were other things. I remember in the 80s, I don't think many of you were even born then, but I remember in the 80s, we discovered a district in Odisha. The 80s is fairly modern, Kalahandi, which was suffering from a severe drought, not producing any food, many people dying of starvation. That's happening in the 80s. So you can see there were things that were affecting us. I also remember in the 70s, a disaster that struck the coastline of Andhra in the form of a cyclone. India failed to anticipate the cyclone till it had almost reached the coastline. Could not give enough warning in advance. And the cyclone caused immense damage. Thousands of people died. Thousands of villages were completely destroyed. It was a huge, huge loss, both in terms of human lives and in terms of property. Well, sometimes you cannot do much against the fury of a cyclone in terms of property. But if you have a warning in advance, which is what science is all about, then you have a means of at least ensuring that human life is not lost or you save most of it. I also remember the election process, the electoral process from my childhood all the way up into the 90s, every general election. It was a cumbersome process. You had to go, stand in a queue, get your turn, take a piece of paper, stamp on it, store it in a ballot box. The ballot boxes would then be taken away that's just half the game. The other half would start when the counting process began. And remember, this is physical manual counting, turn by turn. And so, at different counting stations, people would sit and count physically each ballot paper. Candidates would sometimes counter the counting process, they would say there's an error, we need to recount and sometimes you had to start it all over again. It was so tedious and there were always disputes. There was also this other phenomenon of booth capturing. If you went, sometimes you would be turned away from a booth which had been captured by some hoodlums and then they would cast the vote without your 
knowledge or without your permission, proxy, but in your name, and you would have no say on it. Happened fairly often. Well, remember, right through I kept telling you that don't allow this to think that we were completely in despair, that we were sinking, that things were going wrong and India was doomed. There would always be times when you would worry, there would be times when you would despair. But you know, this is India. That's the message I want the young to imbibe. That India cannot be put down. And the signs have always been there. You have to be a bit of an optimist to see the signs. But the signs were always there, unmistakably. They were always there. You could see that progress was being made. Remember, I told you, India has a rich heritage of great prowess in the world of knowledge, in the world of science, technology, from time immemorial. It is in our DNA. I have just finished reading a book that is written 200 years ago by the then Vice Chancellor of the University of Edinburgh, a historian by the name of Professor Robertson. It is a history of ancient India. It's amazing. Based largely on Greek and Latin sources. I just want you to have an idea of where India has been all along in the realm of knowledge. In this book, Professor Robertson, written 200 years ago, talks of many things. One of the things that really struck me as marvelous was a manuscript in Sanskrit that he comes across where certain observations of the night sky have been made in Karnataka. It's an ancient manuscript. He then engages the services of the professor of mathematics at Edinburgh to help him understand that astronomy. Here's the interesting thing, he says. The mathematician conclusively establishes that the reading actually happens on the date that the manuscript says it has happened. He uses rigorous scientific argument to prove that the reading is on the date that it has happened, of the night sky. More importantly, guess what the date was? More than 5,000 years ago from today. But even more importantly, Professor Robertson and his mathematician colleagues say that that kind of sophistication of the reading indicates that the mathematics behind it was very advanced. They say it cannot have been done unless spherical trigonometry had been very advanced. Just think, 5,000 years ago, India was so advanced in spherical trigonometry and we gave trigonometry to the world. So the point I'm trying to make is, it wasn't just about mathematics. In the realm of knowledge, in all areas, whether it was Sanskrit, the humanities, poetry, drama, in every sense, medicine, India has had a great tradition. It's there in our genes as our heritage. We have to have that faith in us. And let me tell you what is happening in the 21st century with India. Actually, smallpox got eradicated in the late 70s. We completely removed smallpox from India in the 70s. I remember when India had finished this business of removing smallpox, I remember reading a news item in the Times of India of the late 70s of an outbreak of smallpox in the United Kingdom. But it wasn't just smallpox. Those signs were in the air. I remember, which didn't happen too long ago, that India eradicated polio completely from this country. Some of, some of our neighbors still haven't done that. But we have protected our land. We have done away with polio. It is gone. It has been declared a polio-free country. These are signs of strength in India that we are making good progress. 
the country is doing well. Our knowledge systems are kicking in. They're helping the country to become better, stronger, more prosperous. I don't know if you remember, you may or may not even have been born, many of you, but in the 90s, the city of Surat in Gujarat, in the 90s, maybe 93, I cannot remember too well, was struck by the plague. It suddenly reappeared in India. It had gone away around the time of independence, but it reappeared. That's a little disturbing, a little shameful, a little worrisome. But here's what made me feel optimistic. As soon as the plague outbreak happened, and when it used to happen in the past, it would sweep across large areas of territory. This time when it happened, we did not allow it to go outside Surat. We confined it to Surat. And more importantly, within a week, we removed it, eradicated it from Surat also. It was gone. That also was an indicator that some good things are always happening in our land. There were other things that gave me great hope. I have looked at figures of mortality for cholera in the last 10 years. And I believe the figures I have are correct. In the last 10 years, not more than 1,000 or 2,000 people came down with cholera, affected by cholera. And less than 100 died. Think about that. That's a sure sign that we have made progress. Sure sign. There are other indicators. Infant mortality is consistently declining in India. Consistently it is declining at a consistent rate. That's a huge sign that the country, its knowledge systems are beginning to kick in. And you know, there are other diseases that are affecting us which affect other parts of the world. AIDS, tuberculosis, I would just like you to know that the University of Delhi has made its own modest but own important contribution in the realm of tuberculosis when two of our scientists have devised a very reliable, very efficient test for tuberculosis which is highly inexpensive and extremely fast. And at that level, this test is better than the existing tests in the world. And so science and technology and knowledge systems do help make the country better. And I'm sure that such contributions are coming in many ways, not just from Delhi University, but from other universities and institutions of learning in India. This is not the time to enumerate all of them. What about communication? Where have we come? Just think about it. I want you to recognize this. Sometime, I think 2002 or so, the then Prime Minister Vajpayee announced his vision of creating a golden quadrilateral. I read about it in the newspaper one fine morning. That the four metros would be connected through a highway system with high standards, dual carriageways, so accidents wouldn't happen, traffic would move efficiently, and large volumes. And I thought, my God, does he mean it? Is he really going to do that? Do we have the funds for it? Even if we manage to get the funds, do we have the technological capability to build high quality roads of an international court standard? But it happened, it happened. More importantly, we've gone way beyond that. That was a miracle when it happened and it boosted our economy like anything. I looked at the highway between Baroda and Ahmedabad some time back on the internet. I looked at the picture. It's a dual carriageway, so pretty and so efficient. And you can move so quickly. I think you can cover the distances less than one hour. And that isn't there. It's happening in other parts of the country. Roads are being built. Communication is much easier. You can go to Agra in probably an hour and a half or something like that on that expressway. It's happening in many parts of the country. We're getting better and better. And that boosts the economy in so many ways. 
you are of course aware that you can make a rail reservation using your cell phone pay for it also on the cell phone print your ticket anywhere today and remember our rail system is extremely complex we move more than 2 crore passengers each day by rail that's a huge number it's a very complicated network but today sitting anywhere in any part of the world you can not only book your journey from one station anywhere in india to another railway station you can print your own ticket just see where we have come gone are the days of queues gone are the days of not knowing whether you will get a reservation on time or not it's become so much efficient so much more transparent and what to talk of that think of telephones you had to struggle as i told you to get a phone connection when i was newly married and we were living in delhi we didn't have a phone connection and it was impossible for me to connect with my family in other parts of india or abroad it was almost impossible i had to go find a place from where i could make a call and we had applied for a phone but we couldn't get it now everybody carries a cell phone well almost everybody i'm told that more than 800 million cell phones are in use in India. You need to think about this. And you can pick that phone and talk to anyone, anywhere, in any part of the world. That's certainly good. I have spoken and met with villagers, people who live in rural areas, who tell me that the cell phone has been a big boon for them. Look where we have come. We actually leapfrogged the landline connections in the rural and other parts of India. We just moved to a higher dimension. And that is making a huge difference. Internet usage has gone up so much and it is going up by the day. It is amazing. And now, if you need to make an international call, you just need to be anywhere near an internet connection and you can make it almost inexpensively. You just have to pay for the usage of the internet connection. And people do that, young people particularly, but all kinds of people. Elders also do it. My mother-in-law connects with her grandchildren in different parts of the world just using the internet. Saves a great deal of money. And I remember those days since my childhood when you had to reach out to someone outside the nation, you had to wait and wait and wait for the trunk call to materialize. Look where we have come. India is right now connected with the National Knowledge Network which we are using to transmit this lecture also to other parts of India. Live, online. That is the technology we are testing. Just see where we have come. What is happening in the realm of defense? We have come such a long way from the Chinese debacle. India manufactures its own supersonic light combat aircraft, the Tejas. It is a marvelous device. I do not know if you have heard of the missile system known as the Brahmos. It is the most advanced of its kind in the world. It's an amazing missile system. We also have an interceptor missile shield. I remember some time back when the Iraq war, when the senior George Bush was the president, had erupted. Iraq would fire missiles at Israel and Israel would knock many of them out of the sky using the so-called Patriot missile, which it had bought from the United States. It looked like a marvelous technological advance. Well, India has a far superior missile interceptor system. God forbid if any nation around our borders were to try and launch a nuclear device against us, India has the capability of knocking that missile right out in the land from which it starts. And no country dare therefore attack India. We have manufactured our own nuclear submarine. Just think about that. And from that nuclear submarine, underwater, we can launch the BrahMos missile. A huge, huge advance. We've also 
started the process. We, in fact, launched the hull of our own aircraft carrier that we are manufacturing, which will carry high-powered aircraft to guard our seacoast. We've come a long way, a long, long way. This is India. I say all this because I want to imbue in you, I to, want to infuse you, to enthuse you with this spirit of self-belief and self-confidence that this country will continue to make progress. And in the years to come, you will have to bear the task and the burden of taking the land forward. We have our own nuclear weapons. God forbid that we ever have to use them. But at least we know that other nations will think a million times before they dare think of attacking us. What about space? You've all heard of the Mangalyan mission. There's so many interesting features about the Mangalyan mission. Let's look at its cost. From what I can see, and I'm not very well versed with all the facts, but it costs less than $74 million, everything included, everything included. I think, I believe, even the salaries of the people involved. That's cheaper than the cheapest Boeing aircraft. The cheapest Boeing aircraft, when I last looked at the figures, was costing 76 or $77 million. That's how cheap it is. Mangalyan has been orbiting Mars for more than a hundred days now. We are in that rare club which belongs, which includes only three or four nations which can send and has sent a successful mission to Mars. And we did it in the first try. That's a huge achievement. And in such inexpensive, efficient ways. There was great amount of innovation in the technology that went behind the setting up of Mangalyan. We've come such a long way from the Sputnik era when my heart longed to see Indian spacecraft in the skies. India is one of only three countries in the world that has the technological prowess and the economic capability of putting a man on the moon, and I believe we will do that in the next few years. <laughs> Just think about that. And that will be one of our first stages of eventually sending a man to Mars. So we've come a long, long way in the realm of space. We've finally caught up with all the other countries and gone ahead of many of them. So think about that. Have cheer in your heart. Have faith in your heart. And you must be like that. What's happening in the realm of food and agriculture? Before this lecture, I thought I'll take a look at some figures. Remember I told you about importing wheat not knowing whether we were shortchanged or not, and poor quality wheat. You know, at this point in time, India is the second highest producer of wheat in the world. Just think about that. We do not know where to store our wheat. That's what our farmers have done for India. And behind that is knowledge coming from our institutions of learning our agricultural universities, our agricultural institutions, and such places. India is the largest exporter of rice in the world today. Just think about that. And what is happening in Kalahandi? Today, Kalahandi is amongst the top rice-growing districts in India. We wiped out the drought, we wiped out everything that was bad from there in terms of agriculture. Think about that. We have the capability. People like you will come forward and help the nation. I do not know if you know this. At least when I was a child, even milk was not easily available. If you wanted milk that was reliable, pasteurized, properly bottled, you couldn't get it in Delhi. There was great trouble. 
today, and I speak literally of today, India is the largest producer of milk in the world. Think of that. And milk is easily available. We've come such a long way. Such a long way. I'm not trying to say that we have solved all our problems. No. No nation should ever think that it has solved all its problems. That will be a curse. But let us keep having our confidence in ourselves at a high level. Let us have this optimism. Let us have those levels of energy that make us what we are. What about disasters? I'm sure all of you are aware of the cyclone Phelan that struck Odisha some time back. It was a high intensity cyclone. But guess what? How well prepared were we? Do you know much, much before the cyclone actually physically formed, an IIT Mumbai professor, through the internet, in his desk, on his desk, at the institute, managed to put together some data. And he analyzed the data related to weather, and he could tell that this is likely to be a high potency, powerful cyclone that will impact India. What does he do? He alerts the Indian Meteorological Department, the IMD. What does the IMD do? It puts its resources and scientists of India together, much before the cyclone has happened, much before it strikes India. And they build a mathematical model to predict what will happen. This data is available freely and it should be. So other countries also build models. The United States builds one, the Europeans build one, I believe even the Japanese built one. But guess whose model worked the best? This is sophisticated mathematics and high-end computing. Guess whose model worked the best? The Indian model. They predicted the exact time when it will hit landfall. They predicted many other things in advance. You know, because a cyclone brings a huge amount of rain with it, and the Hirakud Dam was in the path of the cyclone, there was grave danger that the dam would burst because of the rain that comes with it. So the idea was to release water stored in the dam prior to the cyclone. The challenge was to figure out how much water to release. If you release too much and the cyclone does not replenish the dam, then you are in trouble. If you don't release enough and the cyclone hits and the water starts overflowing, the dam may burst. And our scientists using that model predicted how much water we should release. And when the cyclone was over, there was only one foot, of, one foot of space left available in the Hirakud Dam. That's how accurate we were. The Indian model worked the best. Contrast that with what happened with the Andhra cyclone. How many lives did we lose in this cyclone? Less than 20, I'm told. Of course, damage to property is something you cannot really take care of when a cyclone of such intensity hits India. Well, the point, as I said repeatedly, is that India has come a long way and will continue to flourish and prosper. And it must be like that. And it has been like that in the centuries gone by. The first hospitals were built in India, in the world. There were other advances we made in medicine, and other realms of knowledge much, much before the rest of the world caught up with us. And this is part of that tradition, part of that game. We do get into trouble sometimes, but the country will continue to make progress. Why? And I see good things happening because young minds like yours will come forward when you move out of our systems of education, you will lend your shoulders to the task of nation building. And you will bring glory and might to the nation. I'm reminded 
Long ago, when Gandhiji was assassinated, Sri Arvind Ghosh said something, and I'm always reminded of it when I see such young minds here. Sri Arvind said that at this time of national tragedy, it is meaningless to say anything. The mother has lost a great son. But he said, let no one despair. In times of need, when the mother calls, her children will gather around her to protect the mother and keep it well. You are those children. You will take the torch forward. So remember when the time comes, you will have to discharge your debts to the nation. Look at what we have done. Look at where we are going and lend your shoulders to the task. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that inspiring lecture. A big hand. Not only the wonderful information, but also a demonstration of the power of technology. And while about 800 people are here in the hall, and I've just heard the Vice Chancellor, Professor Dinesh Singh, deliver his lecture on India in the 21st century, Simultaneously, colleges all around Delhi are also logged in to the same lecture in real time. This indeed is perhaps the first time that any university has reached out to so many people through the power of technology. Now, four of the colleges are partnering our experimental program today, the students from which colleges are with us. These four colleges, IP, Maharaja Agrisen, Keshav Mahavidyalaya, and Aryabhat. These colleges are also available online for an interactive session. So are we ready to go into the interactive session now? Or should we take the questions from the floor first? So let's take the quick questions from the floor, and then we will move into the interactive session. Can you just raise your hands, those who are ready to ask questions? And the mic will be passed on. Remember, your questions are going to be webcast live, so think well. <laughs> think well and hand over your most smart question. Yes, can we start here? Where is the mic, please? Yes. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, ah, yes. Uh, my question is, uh, how will India prosper in near, near future, like in terms of growth? And w are there any economic policies involved? You know, I would like you as a student to start thinking of this problem. I'm so glad you asked that. Maybe these ideas will come from you. Thank you. The young think out of the box and now lend your shoulder to this challenge and think how we could prosper. But the economy is doing well. It will do much better. This is an inherent strength in our economy. It will help us to do well. Remain an optimist. Okay? Thank you. May I have the name of the person who asked the question and the name of the college, please? Uh, my name is Arushi from Aryabhata College. Thank you, Arushi. Thank you. We're ready for the next question. Yes. Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Zilia. I'm from IP College. My question is, in all the sectors that you mentioned, there is a considerable development that we have achieved. And we are training our young generation to you know, grow up and work further in that field. What about the future of food security, sir? Food, indeed, is our basic need. In our 12 years of school education or in the further education system, there is very little significance given to agriculture and our young generation is not encouraged to move further into the field of agriculture. 
So how can we achieve sustainable development without uh, investing on the future of food security and agriculture sector? Well, you, you may be right that maybe in your you know, educational process, you may not have encountered much connected with agriculture. But there are lots of agricultural universities and agricultural institutes in India that are constantly working on this and training students to think about that. And I'm glad that you asked this question. Those institutions have certainly done something because India's food issues are far less than what they used to be. We do not know where to store this surplus wheat that we have. We export rice, the largest exporter. Our milk production is at an all-time high and better than any country in the world. But yes, we need to sustain this. And yes, knowledge systems must forever be alive and alert to that. I would be happy if all institutions shared knowledge more. We do, now that the National Knowledge Network is in place. It would be nice if we could get one course from an agricultural university available to our students through the net. And you could take that even through credit or non-credit, depending on how we devise it. And then more people get acquainted and more people then provide solutions. So that may be a way out. Thank you. We move to question number three. Good evening. I am Sarthak Ganodia from Keshav Mahavidyale. My question to you is that if India has the most advanced defense system there is and we can prevent ourselves from any attack, why does India invest so much in developing their own nuclear weapons instead of using those funds for other things? Thank you. Oh, yes, you're right. We could stop doing one thing and use it for something else. There are two reasons. One, remember, if this is the mistake we made in the 60s when we neglected defense and used our economic, economic strength and our funds for other things. And look what happened to us. You cannot afford to do that. You know, once you made that mistake, you learn from the lessons of history. So that's very important that we spend some money. But more importantly, in those days, we had such limited funds. Now, India has large fund resources at its disposal. And as the economy will continue to grow, this resource base widens and you can use it for many things, which is what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Aisha Sareen from IP College. Uh, my question is that we cannot, uh, you know, we cannot negate that the fact that there is brain drain in our country. Like we are going out to other nations. The thing that I want to ask is that only after there are restrictions put by other nations that we cannot work there, do we come back to our own country. There will always be developed nations in that, uh, which are more developed than India. So how do we ensure that our development, our economic opportunities, our facilities are at par with other nations so that this brain drain stops? You know, I do not deny that there are lots of young people who move away from India. But if you look at the number who move away and the number who stay here, then the number that stays here is much larger. And India would be a poor country, poor in terms of intellectual resource, if that small number is the only people available for India. All of you here will be connected with India and many, many of you will stay here. I know that because I am aware of these things. And so India will continue to draw upon its young who are here. And remember, many who go abroad for a different experience come back. I know so many who come back of their own free will, not because they didn't get a job. That keeps happening. And remember, this is India. Don't worry about it, okay? Okay, one last question from the floor and then we will move into the interactive session with our offline colleges. Good afternoon, yes, sir. Yes, please. Ah. Sir, the biggest thing in our country, sir, you have also told us that we know that after the Azadi, we have been developing a lot. But now, sir, why do we have to look at the developing country? Why? क्योंकि अभी बहुत सारे ऐसे मुद्दे हैं जिस पे हमें प्रगति करनी है। We have to develop a little more, but the day is not far off. 
you know, when India will be what is called a developed nation. बहुत सारे आंकड़े ये बता रहे हैं कि हमारी गति काफ़ी अच्छी है और हम आगे के दिनों में और प्रगति कर लेंगे तो आप ही लोगों के जीवन काल में इंडिया विल बिकम अ डिवेलप नेशन बट यू हैव टू कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट थैंक यू फॉर टेकिंग दिस राउंड ऑफ क्वेश्चन लेट्स ट्राई आउट अ टेक्नोलॉजी सम मोर ऑफ द फोर कॉलेज पार्टनरिंग विद अस Maharaja Agrasen has sent an, a message to say they are ready to take questions and get into a dialogue with the vice chancellor on the basis of the lecture that has just been given. So Sanjeev can we connect to uh, Maharaja Agrasen and would you like to direct us on how to proceed with the questions please? Uh Ram Singh sir and the Sharmanda from Maharaja Agrasen project right So my question to you is, uh, like in these days, massive open online course is the course only open to students of the university, or is it also open to other students who are not part of the university? Ah, oh, good. Well. it's really an experiment. It's not a MOOC in any technical sense. This is one lecture that I have delivered. If there is interest, we can have a few more based on this technology, and of course, once it's on the net, anyone can access it. That's the power of the net, so it'll be open to everyone. Shall we try moving to Keshav now? Okay. Thank you, Maharaja Agrasen College. Just stay in there so you can participate in the discussion. There's one question that I have here from Keshav Mahavidyalay. This question says, "How would you describe?" the changes in the lifestyle of common man in india oh there used to be a common man that lakshman the cartoonist used to portray <laughs> if you go through his cartoons you will see the kind of problems the common man used to face what were the problems getting a telephone connection a rail reservation not standing in large queues for rations being able to talk to people having a better income so so many of these problems that the common man was facing are diminishing but remember the solutions haven't been arrived for everyone and in complete satisfaction we have a long way to go but remain optimistic and the common man will begin to benefit more and more and all of us are part of this common man perception we are all part of that common man group so thank you and there's an uh There, shall we now move to one of the other colleges let's move to ip let's see if we get some good technology there thank you very much keshav stay in there sorry we couldn't hear them too well so let's try ip college this is also we are finding out how well the local technology is working in the colleges the systems have to be put to test uh good afternoon ma'am I'm Good Shafi Tanuvas from IP College, and I would like to put you a question. So you told us as to how we have advanced in technology. You told us how India has come such a far, far way. But sir, one ob observes that the common man is still bound inside the mind. That science is progressing, but when when it comes to the arts, when it comes to freely thinking about our politics, or when it comes to freely thinking. about anything else and to accepting criticism and to accepting laughter we still a little far, we're really far far behind so sir can you tell can you enlighten us on how we can actually pull everybody forward so that technology is essentially paired with acceptance of all dignity well again i am not sure if i have understood it too well but let me quickly repeat the question for everyone here you are now on and uh, you can nod from there or say yes if you think i have understood it well she says that technology has enabled us to do many things but what about other realms of human interaction and learning such as the humanities the arts is that what you are saying the technology cannot really affect them we need to devise other ways and means to pull them all up am i right yes sir yes okay hmm. well one of course the biggest technological marvel is the brain the human brain is a great technological marvel 
and have faith in that. All of these things, all the learning is designed to stimulate the human brain that it must grow and it must do good things. And remember, systems of learning deal with that. Everything else is secondary. Do not put the cart before the horse. This technology that we are using should not become the primary thing. The primary objective is to connect with your minds and to stimulate your minds. And at least you begin to think about this. Why aren't other disciplines not contributing or not being brought up? But don't think like that. All disciplines are making progress. All realms of human endeavor are making progress in India. I mean, whether you look at the realm of art, the realm of cinema, I mean, the kind of good films that come out and the kind of things they do, we're making great progress. So stay optimistic. That's my consistent refrain. Be optimistic. Thank you very much. Now we move to the fourth college. Aryabhat has just sent a message to say they're ready. So let's get on with our discussion with them. This, this question reads as follows. <laughs> Should India spend... <laughs> okay, why don't you hear what we are saying? And then we'll take you a little later. Should India spend 6,000 crores of capital on space innovation when half of India sleeps with half-filled belly? That's a question from Aryabhat College. Oh. In the first instance, this assertion is not true. In half of India does not sleep on a half-filled belly. We've come a long way. But let me also tell you why we should spend money even on space. Two reasons, again, one, there is much more resource, of, there is a much larger resource base available for us to do many things at the same time. And another reason, if you look at the history of space exploration, say in the United States, the number of spin-offs and benefits to society that have come through space innovation, through space technology, is huge, it's enormous. And therefore, when we do these things and we are also innovating, there will be large number. In fact, many spin-offs have already happened from space technology in India. And they will continue to happen and will shower benefits on technology. You cannot limit your vision to only one direction. A nation must take care of many needs and try and balance them. That is where the challenge is. And I believe we're getting better and better at it. Well, I think we move on to yet another phase of our technology testing. And we're sorry to use the vice chancellor as a means of testing the technology. But may I just share that I've just received a wonderful message from the University of Edinburgh. Uh -huh. They have been hearing the lecture and wish to congratulate you on a very fine lecture. Thank you. So partly that is in answer to the question that one of you had is that are other people listening into the lecture and how wide is the outreach? So sometimes the technology works extremely well and sometimes there is a little bit of settling in time. Uh, we should not worry about the details of that nature. I'm very glad that we've had a conversation with four of our colleges. In the next phase, we have a, a surprise for you. There will soon be a quiz that will be displayed on the board here. Please. Pull out your mobile phones, your jotters, your notepads, and start taking whatever little notes you want to. And you will have 10 minutes to answer the quiz through an SMS. Am I right? And Malay, are you the brave one who will receive the SMS? <laughs> OK. I have to tell you that the vice chancellor made this offer to all of us. Who was going to receive the SMS answers? And there was only one hero who said yes. And that is Mr. Malay Nirav, who's our media coordinator. So Malay, you're welcome to come up here and give them your phone number so that they can answer the quiz. Is it here? Oh, it's already there. OK, Can good. you read the number? Can you read the you number? You cannot read the number. No, it's not readable. 
This is Mr. Malay Nira. The telephone number, as I have it, is 98. No? Oh, the different no, one. No, it's okay. right here. Make it, can you? Yes. A little larger. I will read the number out. Please note. 766 seven two 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 three 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 I repeat once more seven six six seven two 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 three 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 okay let's see the Questions then for the quiz? You, you only have to answer. How do you answer? True or false? So just use T or F as the answer. Here are the four questions. What are? OK. The first question. Here's the first question. I hope you're all ready to listen. Can you enlarge this a little? No, it's not possible. Please maybe have a little silence and concentration. I know it's very exciting, especially because we have prizes for the winners. But let's, let's just wait a little bit so that we can hear the questions. Now sc scroll the screen like this. So first question, the Indian Missile Defense System, BrahMos, has been imported from the USA. True or false? Put your answer there in a cell. <coughs> when you send your answer, please put in your name and the name of your college. India has eradicated polio. True, false, send your answer. Third question. India is currently the largest exporter of rice in the world. That's the third question. Fourth, the USA currently produces more milk than India. True, false. The Fifth question, the Indian spaceship Mangalyaan has been orbiting Mars for more than 100 days. True or false? And the final question. In the cyclone failing, more than a thousand people died. True or false? You have to collect all answers under one name, your name and the college name, and send all answers together to the number we gave you. And these answers will be collated and studied, and the top 10 colleges that come up with the best answers will receive special prizes at the Antar Dhwani Festival. Okay, you have five minutes to answer this quiz. Five minutes. But make sure that you write your name and the name of your college when you send the SMS. The instructions on how you are to answer the quiz are right there. Please take a good look. Let me, let me read out the instructions on how to send. We should have said that earlier. Please bear with us and just hear me out on how to answer so first you type BU, then space, then college name, 
don't use more than five characters for college name. So be smart so that we can understand what college you're from. <laughs> then first name of student. So only use your first name. Remember, we can identify you through your cell phone number. So don't worry about it. Then space. Then option. True, false for the first question. Op then space. Then option T, F. So either T or F. Space. Then T or F. Space. You do that for all six. I hope that is clear. Do you want to put the questions back there? So here's, here's an illustration. Can you just... D-U space M-A-C. Now, I have no idea what M... <laughs> Maharaja Agrasen College. Then the name of the student. And then the five answers. Remember, there's a space bar. T, and these are not the correct answers, so don't copy them. Shall we put the questions back up there? Yeah. Not, not legible. Screen may separate karke ek ke baad ek dikhao. So while you're busy with the answers, shall I express heartfelt thanks on behalf of all of us to Vice Chancellor Professor Dinesh Singh for a very enlightening lecture and for demonstrating to us this wonderful use of technology globally as we now know. This is indeed a very special moment for all of us. But there's one little segment that was going to continue for a few more minutes and we'll all be with you. There is a feedback form for those of you who are here in this room. Our volunteers will be giving you a copy of the form. It's very simple. Just fill it up and hand it back before you leave the room. You're requested not to take your forms away with you because we would like a record of each one of you who has been so wonderful as an audience, so participative, attentive, and we do want to keep your feedback with us, and this will help us to plan the next steps in our online lecture series.